everybody. darkest night in the times of trouble that's what he promised us that he would never leave us and he would never forsake us and he's walking through that valley with us and he will never let us down come on we're gonna sing that right here you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna never gonna let me down said you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me come on church can we proclaim that today you're never gonna let never gonna let me down could be right there with you you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down. Oh. Said you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Come on, we can sing that big, y'all. Come on, he's not gonna let you down.
never let you down. Gonna continue on in worship and just set our hearts and our minds on Him. As we spoke earlier, every day it'd be nice if it was all rainbows and unicorns but you know that we will face troubles in this world and we do but isn't it good to know that he's walking with us through these times sometimes just a step at a time one day at a time He is faithful, and that we can depend on, and that's why we can say that it is well with our souls, even in the times of trouble. Grand of earth has quaked before. the sound of his voice sees it all shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken from my regard but through it all through it all my eyes are on you yes. through it all through it all it is well Say that even in the midst of trouble. Far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain, you see that mountain in front of me. I know he's gonna throw it in the midst of the sea. You may be going through something today, but it 
believe that today. You can trust the Lord to be with you. He's the one that makes a way when it seems like there's no way. He's your provider. He loves you. He sees you. Just keep your eyes fixed on him. It's going to be all right. one that makes a way come on can we lift him up on this one now I like it and I'm sure the Lord likes it too when you put your hands together come on y'all yeah he's the keeper of his word that word that never changes Well, we just want the Holy Spirit in this place today. Dave's going to bring us a good word here in just a few minutes. Getting our hearts set on the Lord right now. Ready to receive what he has for us today. Oh, yeah. You are here. You're moving in. I worship you, yeah. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. Lord, I worship you. We're going to sing that again. You are here. We feel you moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You came to do some work in this place. Yes, I worship you. I worship you. Come on, he makes a way. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. He's the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. He's right here. You are here. You're touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. you Lord yeah. I worship you you are here you're gonna turn some lives around today Lord so I worship you yes I worship you said you you are here you're 
Yes. We may not see with our eyes, but that's what faith is all about. When you don't see and you don't feel, but you still trust and you know that He's working it out for your good, just like He promised. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never. I might not see it. I might not even feel it. Come on. But I know that you told me that when I wake up in the morning, you're just fixated on me. Your creation that you made. That you love every hair on my head. Never stop, never stop and you care about me. Never stop, never stop and you're working it out for my good. You're always going before me. Yeah. And you never stop working, no. I don't have to see it. Because I trust you, Lord. Yes, y'all can keep that going. Thank you so much, band, for leading us in that powerful, powerful uh, time of worship. I, I definitely know that God is a miracle worker because um, this weekend, my wife was among over a hundred women who went to a women's retreat here uh, with Riverbend and uh, had an amazing time of, of learning more about who they are in Christ and just getting some rest and some community and fellowship time in. But that's not the miraculous part. The miraculous part, although that is good, is the fact that I kept all four of my children alive all weekend long. Yeah! 
Um, well, my name is Rin. I'm the student pastor here at Riverbend, and it's uh, a privilege to get to stand here before you and share a few things that we have coming up that we're excited about as a church. The first one is Riverbend Essentials. This is taking place um, in the lounge, which is by the Welcome Center next Sunday, directly following the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock service. This is a place that's open to anyone. It's low pressure, a casual gathering where we are going to talk about our vision, the history of the church, answer any questions, and just kind of talk about what makes Riverbend tick who we are, what we're all about. So that's Riverbend Essentials next Sunday. If you're new or if you've been here for a while and you haven't gotten that time in yet, we invite you to come to it. The next thing I'm a little biased about because as a student pastor, I get thrilled when we have amazing youth events. So I wanted to share this amazing youth event with you that we have coming up on February 18th through the 20th. Um, It is called ATX Student Weekend, and it's a collaborative youth event where we bring in powerful worship and engaging speaker and just have an absolutely fantastic um, worship session. Basically, it's going to be hosted at the Austin Ridge, but our hub, our our home base is going to be here at Riverbend. So if you have a teenager, um, if you know a teenager who knows some teenagers, make sure they get signed up for this. We're going to be serving the community, worshiping, connecting. It's going to be a powerful, amazing time for students grades 6 through 12. And one thing I've noticed about Riverbend is that there always seems to be something going on. There's always something exciting happening. And I love that because God is on the move. He is working. He is moving, right? Uh, And things like ATX Weekend and Riverbend Essentials and um, even the women's reach, they wouldn't be possible if it weren't for you and your generosity. Uh, we are all a part of, of this thing that's happening, that's having an impact now um, in the generations to come and echoing all through eternity. So if you give to Riverbend, I just want to say thank you for that, but also wanted to make you aware of some opportunities that we have right now to either continue or start doing that. The first is online or through our app. You can even text it in at 84321. Um, And there's also even some physical options here in person, these black boxes. If you want to drop a gift in one of those, they're located across the mezzanine here. Uh, But in any case, so thankful for you. So thankful for your heart that you're here. You decided to worship with us this morning. We're going to continue in that. But first, if you would pray with me. Dear God, thank you for an amazing, powerful morning where we get to step into your presence and sing praises to you. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to to give back to a God who gave everything for us. Thank you for a family and a community like Riverbend, where we can come together and, and fellowship and have community with people who are just trying to, to figure out what it really means to follow you. Who is this, this Jesus? Lord, I pray over the rest of today and this morning as as we get into your word that you lead us, that you guide us, that you speak to us, and that that we may be receptive. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And it's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is our life, 2022. 
The year of our Lord, 2022. 2022, Anno Domini. 2022 years since the course of human history was changed by the most significant person who has ever lived. Technically, what we say when we say 2022 is that that indicates that there have been 2,022 orbits of this rock we call the Earth around this thing we call the Sun. During these 2,021 and 30 days and more or less 12 hours, these orbits have been characterized by the rotation of our planet on its axis. This is fortunate for us because if the Earth didn't rotate on its axis, we would have barbecue on one side of the Earth and Antarctica on the other. But it rotates in a pattern that, that, that spins on its axis in what we call days. And it takes 365 and approximately a quarter days or 365 and a quarter rotations for the Earth, for us, to go around the sun. So that means that, uh, that during this time, we have navigated the sun 365 and a quarter days, 2,022 times. Every day, we go through 9,918 minutes. And every day is also 548,280 minute or 9,000 hours and minutes. And this is one of those hours. And that was one of those minutes in the year 2022. Now, to give you an idea of what that actually looks like, imagine that 2022 years are 36 inches long. This is the time from when the time Jesus came in year one to 2022, today. If you measured out our life in terms of these 36 inches, one year on this ruler would equal 0 0.017, 0 0.845, and seven or six, six or seven other digits of one inch on this scale which is to say that if this represents 2,022 years, and you were to be fortunate enough to live to be 100 years, your life would be this long on this scale. Doesn't seem like much, does it? The reality is only 4.7% of us will live to be an inch and three quarters long. Three weeks ago, we began a conversation about how do we navigate in the difficult days of life? How do we navigate in the storms of life? And we pretended to call it a course. We called it a class in navigating the storms of life. And it came with a Coast Guard certification for navigation, and really we're not navigating any water. This is not a maritime navigation. It's a real life navigation. How do we survive the difficult and the struggles and the storms and the tragedies and the traumas of life? And the curriculum for our study was based on two stories from the life of Jesus where he was at sea where he was on the water, where his disciples were lost in a storm. The first story is the story where Jesus is in a boat, and the boat is sinking, and Jesus calms the storm. The story is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 8, and in Mark chapter 4, and in Luke chapter 8. And if you were fortunate enough to be here last week, you heard the brilliant Stephanie Rollins share with us the reminder that this story from Luke's perspective is a story that reminds us that Jesus is in the boat with us. That he's in, the, like we are, he's in the wind and the waves. 
and that he is, even though it may seem like he's asleep and not paying attention, he is in the boat and he will get us to the other side. It is a lesson in navigating the difficult days and remembering that God is with us in the storm. The other story is the story of Jesus walking on the water. And it's a story that is told to us in Matthew chapter 18, or Matthew chapter 14, and in Mark chapter 6, and in John chapter 6. And two weeks ago, we talked about the story of Matthew and Mark and their perspective and how each of these stories, each of these three stories tell the same thing, that Jesus was walking on the water. But each of these stories ends differently. Matthew's story ends with Peter walking on the water, stepping out of the boat. It's a, it's a reminder that when, when God comes to us and, and we're in the midst of our struggles, and, and God shows up and, and the cancer is in remission and our child is going to be okay and the thing that we thought was going to be the end of us was not and everything works out and, and we see our way through the storm that sometimes we celebrate that and we gain confidence that God is going to see us through, God is going to show up in the midst of the storms of life. And that we celebrate that and we get excited about that and enthusiastic about that. But the opposite of that is the way that Mark tells the end of the story. Mark talks about how hard the hearts were of the disciples. And that they were filled with doubt. Because sometimes when things work out, we're like, I don't know how that happened. I, I'm not sure that I understand what was going on. I'm not sure why I had to have the problems in the first place. And, and we're confused and we're skeptical and we're cynical and, and, and we doubt. We wonder, did God actually show up or was that just divine coincidence? Was that just good fortune? Was that just the way things were meant to turn out? And both of these are appropriate responses to when God shows up in the difficult times in our lives, when we see our way through the darkness and come out on the other side, it's okay sometimes that we celebrate that, and other times it's okay that we're confused and we're uncertain, and we didn't know how that happened. But it's John, in John chapter 6, who gives us a totally different perspective of the end of the story of Jesus walking on the water. John chapter 6, the story of Jesus walking on the water, follows right after the feeding of the 5,000. In John chapter 6, at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, when, when people were noticing that something miraculous was happening, there may have been, it says there were 5,000 men there, which means there may have been ten or 15,000 people there. And they started distributing basically what started out as five loaves of bread and two fish and everyone had their fill. And every time someone reached in the basket for a sandwich, for a filet of fish sandwich, there were more inside. It never ran out. And the people began to say in John chapter 6 verse 14, maybe this is Elijah. Maybe this is the prophet that Isaiah told us about in Jeremiah. Maybe this is the one who we've been expecting and they began to speculate among themselves. And Jesus knew not only what they were saying, but he knew what they were thinking. You see, Jesus knew that they were, they were thinking, if this is the guy, let's run home and get our pitchforks and our clubs and, and let's force the issue. Let's begin a revolution. Let's, let's begin an overthrow of our Roman overlords. And Jesus didn't want that to happen at all. Now, Matthew and Mark tell us that immediately when Jesus knew this, he told his disciples, go to the boat. Go to the boat and get ready, and we're going to go to our home base in Bethsaida. And it says that somehow he said goodbye to the folks who were gathered there, and then he disappeared. He, he left, and they couldn't follow him. He went into the hills to be by himself to pray. Now John picks up this story in verse 16 and he says that the disciples were waiting down by the boat and they were waiting for quite some time. They waited until after sunset. 
until the evening, and it, and it began to grow dark. And they said, I, I don't know where he is. They thought, well, maybe we'll just, we'll just sail up, up the coastline of the lake, and, and we'll go to Capernaum, and we'll meet him there. And so they get in their boats, and they set out on the Sea of Galilee for Capernaum, a short distance, just a few miles. But it says that suddenly a strong gale blew down on the Sea of Galilee. And they were blown off course. In fact, John tells us that they were three to four miles off course. When suddenly they noticed in the middle of the night, Jesus walking toward them on the water. Matthew and Mark tell us that it was three o'clock in the morning. And Jesus was walking on the waves they would see him and then he'd walk into the valley of the wave and then on the crest of the wave, the valley of the wave. And it says that they were terrified. No duh. Of course, they didn't know what was going on three o'clock in the morning. And Jesus walks up to the boat and he says, don't be afraid. I am here. But then in verse 21, John brings the story to a close by telling us something unbelievable. He says that they were eager to get him in the boat. They were glad to see him. And as soon as he stepped foot in the boat, immediately they arrived at their destination. He just told us they were three or four miles offshore. What does he mean that immediately they arrived at their destination? Wait a minute. You mean they went three to four miles in an instant? Do they defy the laws of physics? What's going on here? What is he talking about? Well, it's going to get weird. It's going to get weird here today. And I don't mean Austin weird. I mean like science weird. I am going to go all Picasso on your ass today. <laughs> And I just said ass in church. And no. Hold on. There are some people here that that bothers. And that's a good thing. And because we're going to get weird, because I just said ass in church, maybe we should pray. Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, that you would use your word spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to remind us of your perspective. May we see our lives and your world as you see it. Pray that you would change our minds and our hearts and our perspective today. Pray that for myself, for my family, for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Jesus walking on the water in the book of John only occupies basically six sentences. But it's the last 11 words of John chapter 6 in verse 21 that I want to focus on. It is Kai, you... Ethos, Egenita, Ta, Poilon, Epi, Tes, Gais, Ace, Hang, Upagon. More or less. And literally what this means is, and immediately, they became, you know my, and again, they became the boat, or it became the boat, at the place or at the land to which they were going. And immediately they arrived. Now to understand this, I think we have to focus on these two words. And they draw our attention to two things. First of all, they draw our attention to language and consciousness.
and choose space and time. Looking through these lenses of language and, and consciousness at what John says here, the first thing to know is that language matters. Words are important. I said the word ass just a few moments ago. And there are some of you here who are uncomfortable with that. And that's a good thing. You should be. There are some of you here with your children. And you're like, Dave, what did you do? Try to tell my kids not to use words like that. Well, let me tell you what you should tell them. So be careful with your words. Be thoughtful with your words. Because your words are sharp. Our words are like a knife. And our words can cut to hurt. Or our words can cut to heal. Remember that old child limerick? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It's a lie. It's a flat out lie. Sticks and stones can break our bones, but names can break our souls. Words can cut us into our hearts. Words matter. And the problem is we are living in a postmodern information age we are living in an age where we have monetized ideas and words and images. And we have, we have an abundance, a ubiquitous, a, a ubiquitous communication channel that we can almost never avoid. And you would think that because of the volume of, of words that we use, that we would be even more precise and more careful. But the opposite is true. That because we have monetized our vocabulary, we use words to mean whatever we want them to mean. Whatever is most efficient or effective for us. We redefine our language as it suits our needs. And if we are going to understand our place in the universe, if we are going to understand anything transcendent, our words have to mean something. And if anybody knew this, it was the guy that wrote these words. The Apostle John understood the power of words. And we know that because this is how John began the story of the gospel of Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In verse 14 of John chapter 1, he says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we laid our eyes on, in, in precise image, the glory of God, full of grace and truth. Words matter. Words, words are how we know who we are. It's how we, how we are self-aware. It is the foundation of our consciousness. Now, the study of consciousness is a multidisciplinary study. It involves, it involves a broad range. If you're going to study consciousness and what does it mean for us to be aware of our existence in the universe, you have to have a, a working knowledge of a number of academic disciplines. You have to have a working knowledge of, of biology and neuroscience and neurology and how our bodies and how our brains work, how, how our senses work. You need a basic understanding of psychology and psychiatry and philosophy. You even need a basic understanding of mathematics and physics. Because consciousness, the study of how we know the things that we know, is, is a complicated subject. It is, it is because we're dealing with the abstract and the undefinable. In, in circles, academic circles, of people who study consciousness and the development of consciousness, there's, a, there's a, a form or a formula, and it's called the UTOK, the Unifying Theory of Knowledge. And the basic, the basic proposal is, or the basic hypothesis, is that there are building blocks of consciousness. And outside of the building blocks of consciousness are the, are the unconscious, the metaphysical things. But the building blocks of consciousness start with the material world, with the inorganic world. 
But the inorganic in our world has no consciousness, no awareness of itself. You may be a geologist who thinks that dirt has emotions, but dirt doesn't feel anything. When you stick a shovel in it, it doesn't cry. Uh, material, material things that are inorganic have no consciousness. But once, once you enter into the world of living organisms, they have a basic sense of consciousness. Even single cell organisms respond to stimuli. Plants actually respond to their environment. Trees push their roots down into the soil to gather moisture, to gather water so that they can live. Flowers bloom in the sun and in the seasons that are conducive for their life. They respond to the stimuli and they interact with their environment. It's a basic form of consciousness that is in the animal world. Animals have a basic form of consciousness, a basic response, whether it's instinctive, a salmon that is swimming upstream, or a, or a goose that flies south for the winter. These, these behaviors are a form of consciousness. But the highest forms of consciousness are the we and the I. When living creatures start to interact with each other, when animals start to form flocks and herds and packs and there, there is an interaction with their environment, there is a, a, a developing form of consciousness. It is an awareness of the world around them and an interactivity. They do things that influence others and they are influenced by others. But the deepest form of consciousness where we live is in the eye, in the eye of self-awareness. This is where modern psychology and modern psychiatry build their camp. It's where Sigmund Freud said that we understand ourselves by understanding the three parts of our person, the id, the ego, and the superego. And neuroscientists are experimenting with the connection between the, the goo that is in between our ears that we call our brain and the synapses that fire off in our brain that give us a sense of self-awareness. The mind, the mind and, and, the, and the brain bridge is a mystery that, that we're just beginning to sort out. And in this, in this mystery of consciousness, there's only one thing that is the tool for understanding who we are and why we're here and what our place and our purpose in the world and in the universe is, and that's language. Language is the tool that we use to understand our purpose and our place, to understand our existence, our consciousness. And this becomes, uh, this becomes really challenging when we talk about space and time. When you, start to, when you start to evaluate our place in space and time, things, things start to get really fuzzy around the edges. The, the idea that we have a sense of our place in history and in time and our physical space in this universe is a complicated idea. Now, people have tried, people have tried to, to synthesize it. They've tried to, to, to create an awareness of our, our place in space and time. And, and, and the reason that it gets so complicated is because space and time is really a study of this. Infinity, eternity. The study of space and time and our conscious awareness of space and time leaves us not with the question of what is happening now, but what happened before and what's happening in the future and our place in that paradigm of space and time. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are some really smart people that work at Facebook. They really do. I mean, these people realized not just, and, and they didn't just realize 10 years or so ago that the platform, Facebook as an internet vehicle, as a platform of communication, has a shelf life. That there will be a day not too far in the future when the only people who use Facebook are grandparents showing pictures of their grandchildren. Because I promise you, your grandchildren don't use Facebook now. 
And the people at Facebook realized, we've got to diversify our company. And so they began investing in other forms of communication, in other platforms. And did you see how they rebranded themselves just a few weeks ago, just a few months ago? They rebranded themselves by taking the symbol for infinity and bending it. They kind of bent it into a, an M. And they called themselves Meta. You know what Meta means? Meta means everything. And meta means nothing. And Meta means anything. Because they understand that when we deal with the area of space and time, we are dealing with things that even our language cannot explain. Now, this transformation didn't happen overnight. This was not something that, that happened in a, a single moment. It began back in, the, back in the Enlightenment and back through the Renaissance with the development of empirical method when people began to question how the universe worked and not just how the universe worked, but why did it work the way that it worked. And the two areas of study, the two academic areas that became most important without anyone realizing it, are the areas of epistemology and theology. You know what epistemology is? Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. You know what theology is? Is the study of how we know what we believe. And where we live is where these two things converge. What we know and what we believe. If you're not sure that that's going on, do you, have you paid attention to this COVID thing? Have you paid attention to how people are describing what's going on with COVID? They tell us what we know, but then they get to what they don't know, and then what do they tell us? what they believe, if you pay attention, you realize that we've gotten to the point where we interchange those words back and forth. That what I know and what I believe are now the same thing. Because this is where truth is. Now, like I said, this didn't start just at a, f a few generations ago. This started back in the 14th and the 15th century. But it was really Albert Einstein that popularized this, this, this train of thought. In 1905, when he published his theory of special relativity, but it really became popular in 1915 when he published his theory of general relativity. And I think we all know what it is. It's represented by this. E equals mc squared. In layman's terms, you, you know what that means. That means everything is energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed there's a constant in the universe, and it is energy. And the way you calculate the amount of energy in the universe is you take the mass of the universe, multiply it times a constant, the speed of light in Einstein's case, and square it. And then you have the amount of energy that has always existed and will always exist. But basically what that means is that everything is everything. That means that the air we breathe and the skin on our bodies, and the planet that we walk on, and the star that we orbit around are all made of the same stuff. We're all made of energy. We're all made of atoms with protons and neutrons and nucleus, and, and they combine in ways to make the reality that we see. And in the complexity of all of these things, we live in this place trying to find truth in between what we know and what we believe. You know who visualized this? Picasso. Pablo Picasso. When I was a teenager, I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and they were having an, ex an exhibition of Picasso's great works. And in one room all by itself, there was a painting that he did in 1931 called Guernica. Guernica was a village in northern Spain that during the Spanish Civil War, soldiers went in and massacred the entire village. 
And Picasso painted, and this is a giant painting, it's probably 30 feet long and 12 feet high. It takes up an entire wall of an exhibit room. It was in a room by itself. And the image is, is, conveys this, this sense of danger and violence and brutality. But it's unrecognizable. It's true with the portraits that he painted. I mean, if he painted a portrait and you saw it, you wouldn't look at it and go, I know that person. That's Sally. Oh, no, that's Susan. No, that's... And his point was, you can't know that. You can believe that. And what's true about his work is that it merges epistemology and theology. It points to the truth is part what we know and part what we believe. Now at this point, you're thinking, Dave, what does all that have to do with Jesus walking on the water? Did he or didn't he? What, what am I supposed to believe about, about this guy who walked on the water and you're telling me that this is a metaphor for how God shows up in the storms of our life? Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Eutheos againeto. Immediately, they arrived at their destination. Now, does that mean that they transcended the laws of physics? They were three to four miles offshore, and when Jesus' foot touched the boat, the boat was transported outside of the laws of time and space, three to four miles to the shore in Gennesaret. Does it, do, do you know that? Or do you just believe that? Well, I believe that, because <laughs> the laws of physics were on a holiday on that day anyway. Jesus was walking on the water for crying out loud. Him transporting a boat three to four miles in an instant, that was child's play compared to walking three to four miles on top of the water. Do I know that that was true? No. Do I believe that that was true? Yes. Because what John is telling us is that in the storms, we are to see things from a divine perspective. When it seems like my whole life is coming apart, like all I know in my life is darkness, all I know is, is pain and struggle, it will never end. When this is my life, He's saying there's another way to look at things. There's an eternal way to look at things. Step back and look at your life from 2,000 years. This is your life compared to 2,000 years. 2,000 years is just a fragment of human history. Andy, can you help me out for a second? Can you take this tape measure and go about 12,000 years, which is 15 feet? <laughs> On this scale, show us 15 feet. That's just about 12,000 years. That's about how long anthropologists believe Homo sapiens have walked on the earth. This distance. This is your life. This is 12,000 years. And you go up there to 100 feet. A hundred feet. Go, go up, up, up that way. Yeah. Hey, Mark, Dr. Mark, can you help uh, Andy get the tape up there? Mark Felger? Just, just help him because we're going to put an eye out if we're not careful. He's going to go up a hundred feet. I can tell you where he's going to wind up. He's going to wind up three pews from the end. Mark, can you make sure we don't get tangled up there? Thanks, Doc. Time passes slowly, and <laughs> we okay there? Okay, let us know when you're 100 feet. Up there, dinosaurs still roam the earth. 
60 or 70,000 years ago. Andy, go out 300 feet. Go. <laughs> Just see you later. Go. Just keep going. It's a 300, yeah. Bye. Bye, Andy. It's a 300-foot tape. He's eventually going to come to the end, and I can tell you where he's going to be. He's going to be in the circle drive out there. 300 feet. That's only 200,000 years. 200,000 years, the Earth was had been around for billions of years. Astrophysicists suggest that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. On this scale, 13.8 billion billion years would be represented by 3,807 miles. That means you could go in a straight line from Austin to Maui and overshoot it by 200 miles. And that's just what we know. When you think, my life, this is, this is all there is. This is as good as it gets. I'm never getting out of this storm. Andy, you can start reeling the tape in. Can you, can you tell Andy to, okay, there you go. Time is collapsing, even as we speak. <laughs> I think what John is saying, the perspective that John has, when Jesus shows up in our storm, is the perspective that God will always provide. That this is not all there is. This is your life. And that is your destiny. We're going to close out our service today with one more worship tune. I'm happy to see you already on your feet. If you guys want to stand and join with us. As we sing about the goodness of God and how we love Him. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so. the goodness of God yeah I love your voice cause you have led me through the fire in the darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as the goodness of God. Yes, he's been so faithful and all the goodness of God. Yeah. Sure. Just running after, running after me. Just keeps on pursuing us. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness 
forsake you He'll just keep running after you yeah. We want to thank you guys for being here with us today Worshiping with us here at Riverbend We want to wish you well as you go May you be blessed and have a safe week And we can't wait to see you back here next week to worship with us once again right here at Riverbend Church. Oh.